This is a recording of Action 1893, Essay on a Critique of Life and a Science of Practice, by Maurice Blondel, translated by Oliva Blanchette. Introduction Yes or no, does human life make sense, and does man have a destiny? I act, but without even knowing what action is without having wished to live, without ex knowing exactly either who I am or even if I am. This appearance of being which flutters about within me, these light and evanescent actions of a shadow, bear in them, I am told, an eternally weighty responsibility, and that even at the price of blood, I cannot buy nothingness, for, because for me it is no longer. Supposedly, then, I am condemned to life, condemned to death, condemned to eternity, why and why by what right, if I did not know it and did not will it? I shall make a clean breast of it. If there is something to be seen, I need to see it. Perhaps I will learn whether or not this phantom I am to myself, with this universe I bear in my gaze, with science, with its science and with its ac magic, with the strange dream of consciousness, has any solidity. I shall no doubt discover what is hidden in my acts, at that very depth where, be without myself in spite of myself, I undergo being and become attached to it. I will know whether I have a sufficient knowledge and will, con and will concerning the present and the future never to sense any tyranny in them, whatever they may be. The problem is inevitable. Man resolves it inevitably. And this solution, true or false, but voluntary at the same time is necessary, each one bears it in his actions. This is why we must study action. The very meaning of the word and the richness of its contents will unfold little by little. It is good to propose to man all the exigencies of life, all the hidden fullness of his works, to strengthen within him, along with the force to affirm and to believe, the courage to act. 1. To take stock of the immediate evidence. Action, in my life, is a fact, the most general and the most constant of all, the expression within me of a universal determinism. It is produced even without me. More than a fact, it is a necessity, which no doctrine denies, since such a denial would require a supreme effort, which no man avoids, since suicide is still an act. Action is produced even in spite of me, more than a necessity, action often appears to me as an obligation. It has to be produced by me, even when it requires of me a painful choice, a sacrifice, a death. Not only do I use up my bodily life in action, but I am forever putting down feelings and desires that would lay claim to everything, each for itself. We do not go forward. We do not learn. We do not enrich ourselves, except by closing off for ourselves all roads but one, and by impoverishing ourselves of all that we might have get known or gained otherwise. Is there a more subtle regret than that of the adolescent obliged, on entering life, to limit his curiosity, as if with blinders? Each determination cuts off an infinity of possible acts. No one escapes this natural mortification. Will I at least have the power to stop? No, we have to go forward. To suspend my decision in order to renounce nothing? No, I must commit myself under pain of losing everything. I must compromise myself. I have no right to wait, or else I ha no longer have the power to choose. If I do not act out, my own move out of my own movement, there is something in me or outside of me that acts without me. And what acts without me ordinarily acts against me. Peace is a defeat. Action leaves no more room for delay than death. Head, heart, and hands, I must therefore give them over willingly, or else they are taken from me. If I withhold my free dedication, I fall into slavery. No one gets along without idols, neither pious folk nor even the most libertine. A scholastic or partisan prejudice a watchword, a worldly compromise, a sensual delight, and it is enough for all repose to be lost, all freedom to be sacrificed, 
and that is often the reason why we live and why we die. Will I be left the hope of guiding myself, if I will to, in the fullness of light, and of governing myself only according to my ideas? No. Practice, which tolerates no delay, never entails a perfect clarity. The complete analysis of it is not possible for a finite mind. Any rule of life that would be grounded only on a philosophical theory and abstract principles would be to marry us. I cannot put off acting until all the evidence has appeared, and all evidence that shines before the mind is partial. Pure knowledge is never enough to move us, because it does not take hold of us in our entirety, in every act there is an act of faith. Will I at least be able to re accomplish what I have resolved? whatever it be, as I have resolved it. No. Between what I know, what I will, and what I do, there is always an inexplicable and disconcerting disproportion. My decisions go beyond my thoughts, and my acts go beyond my intentions. Sometimes I do not do all that I will. Sometimes I do, almost without knowing, what I do not will. And these actions that I do not completely foresee that I did not entirely order, once they are accomplished way on all of my life and act upon me, seemingly more than I acted upon them, I find I am like their prisoner. They sometimes turn against me. Like an insubordinate son before his father. They have fixed the past. They encroach on the future. Impossibility of abstaining, my, of abstaining and of holding myself in reserve. Inability to satisfy myself to be sufficient and to cut myself loose. That is what a first look at my condition reveals to me. That there is constraint and a kind of oppression in my life is not an illusion, then, nor a dialectical game. It is a brute fact of daily experience. At the principle of my acts, in the use and after the exercise of what I call my freedom, I seem to feel all the weight of necessity. Nothing in me escapes it, if I try to evade decis decisive initiatives, I am enslaved for not having acted. If I go ahead, I am, sub I am subjected to what I have done. In practice, no one eludes the problem of practice, and not only do does each one raise it, but each, in his own way, inevitably resolves it. It is this very necessity which must be justified, that has to be justified. And what would it mean to justify it? if not to show that it is in conformity with the most intimate aspiration of man. For I am conscious of my servitude only in conceiving and wishing for a complete emancipation. The terms of the problem, then, are sharply opposed. On one side, all that dominates and oppresses the will. On the other, the will to dominate all or to be able to ratify all. For there is no being where there is only constraint. How then resolve the conflict? Of the two terms of the, of the problem, which is the unknown? To start from. Is it goodwill that will tr show trust, as if it were betting on something sure and infinite, without being able to find out before the end whether in seeming to sacrifice everything to this something, and has really given up nothing to acquire it? Or must we consider first only what is inevitable and forced by refusing to make any concession, by repelling all that can be repelled, in order to find out, with the necessity of science, where this necessity of action leads in the end, except to show simply in the name of determinism itself that goodwill is right. The first way is unavoidable and can suffice for all. It is the practical way. We must define it first, if only to set aside the part of those, the majority and often the better ones, who can only act without discussing action. Besides, as we shall so show, no one is exempt from, empt from entering on this direct route. But it will be good to prove but how another method becomes legitimate to confirm the first and to anticipate the final revelations of life and how it is necessary for a scientific solution of the problem. The object of this work must be this very science of practice. 2. Before discussing the exigencies of life, even in order to discuss them, we must have submitted to them, 
can this first verification suffice to justify suffice to justify them? And will it be possible without any effort of thought through experience alone for all equally to find the certain solution that will absolve life of all tyranny and satisfy every conscience? I am and I act, even in spite of myself. I find myself bound, it seems, to answer for all that I am and do. I will submit without rebellion, then, to this constraint, which I cannot suppress, because this effective docility is the only direct method of verification. Whatever apparent resistance I may offer in opposition to it, nothing, in fact, can exempt me from obeying it. Hence, I have no other recourse but to have confidence. Every attempt at insubordination, while failing to rescue me from the necessity of action, would be a lack of consistency, as contrary to science as to conscience. It can never be said too often, no factual difficulty, no speculative doubt, can legitimately dispense anyone whatsoever from this practical method which I am forced and resolved to apply first. I am asked for head and heart and hands. I am ready. Let us experiment. Action is a necessity. I will act. Action often appears as an obligation. I will obey. So much the worse if it is an illusion, a hereditary prejudice, a, res a residue of Christian education. I need a personal verification, and I will verify at whatever cost. No one else can exercise this control for me and in my place. The issue concerns me and my all. It is myself and my all that I put into the experiment. One has only oneself, and the true proofs, the true certitudes, are those that cannot be communicated. One lives alone as one dies alone. Others have nothing to do with it. But, is it imp but if it is impossible to attempt a trial by proxy, would it not be enough to do so by projection in the mind's eye? Amusing people, all these theoreticians of practice, who observe, deduce, and discuss, legislate on what they do not do. The chemist makes no claim to produce water without hydrogen and oxygen. I will not claim to know myself and to test myself, to acquire certitude, or to appreciate the destiny of man, without having thrown into the crucible all the man I bear in myself. The organism of flesh, of appetites, of desires, of thoughts, whose obscure workings I feel perpetually is a living laboratory. That is where my science of life must first be performed. All the deductions of moralists, based on the most complete facts, on mores and social life, are ordinarily artificial, narrow, and meager. Let us act and leave aside their alchemy. But there is doubt, darkness, difficulty. Again, so much the worse. We have to go ahead just the same if we are if we are to know what is at issue. The true reproach that is addressed to conscience is not that it is not, does not say enough, it is that it demands too much. Besides, for each step there is enough room. There is enough light, enough of a faint call for me to go where I have anticipated something of what I am looking for, a sense of fullness, an illumination on the role I have to play. A confirmation of my conscience. One does not stop at midnight in an open field. Were I to use the darkness in which practical necessities and obligations seem wrapped as a pretext for not trusting them or not making any sacrifice, I would be failing my method, and instead of finding an excuse for myself, I would be condemning myself if I dared to blame what this obscurity conceals or to cloak myself rashly with it in order to abandon the experiment. The scientist, too, is often forced to be daring and to risk the possible, possibly precious material that he has in hand. He does not know in advance what, is he, what he is looking for, and yet he looks for it. It is by anticipating the facts that he reaches them and discovers them. When he finds, he does not always foresee, nor does he entirely explain it to himself because he never goes into the workshops of nature down to their last depth. This precious material I have to expose is myself, since I cannot carry on the science of man without man. Life abounds with ready-made experiments, 
hypotheses, traditions, precepts, duties, which we only have to verify, which we have only to verify. Action is that method of precision, that laboratory test, where without ever understanding the details of the operations, I receive the sure answer no dialectical artifice can replace. That is where competence is to be found, no matter if it costs dearly. But still, is there not equivocation and lack of consistency in this rule of life? If we are faced with many options, why sacrifice this or that? Do we not have the right, almost the duty, to experiment with everything? No, there is neither ambiguity nor lack of consistency when faithful to the enterprise and putting the goodness of living ahead of the pride of thinking, we dedicate ourselves without haggling with, consci with conscience and its simple testimony. Moral experimentation, like every other, must be a method of analysis and synthesis. Sacrifice is that real analysis which by mortifying the all too imperious and all too familiar appetites brings them into, eviden into evidence a higher will that is, that, it, that is only in resisting them. It does not impoverish. It develops and brings the human person to completion. Is it those who have tried heroism who complain? Would we want life always to be good to the wicked? That, it is, when we, that is when it would be evil. If for, the, if for them it remained sweet, serene, savory, and if there was as much light and deviance as on the straight path, it is not a question of speculative satisfaction, but of empirical verification. If I already have the solution, I would be inexcusable. If I were to lose it while waiting to understand it, it would be to run away from it in order to reach it. The curiosity of the mind does not suppress practical necessities, practical necessities under pretext of studying them. And in order to think, I am not dispensed from living. I need at least the shelter of a provisional morality, because the obligation to act is of another order than the need to know. Every derogation from the dictates of conscience is founded on a speculative prejudice, and every critique of life that relies on an incomplete experience is radically incompetent. A thin ray of light does not suffice to illumine the immensity of practice. What we see does not destroy what we do not see. And as long as we have, have not been able to make a perfect connection between action and thought, and between conscience and science, all unlettered or philosophers have only to remain, like children, docile, naively docile to the empiricism of duty. Thus, in the absence of all theoretical discussion, as also during the course of all speculative investigation into action, a direct and quite practical method is offered me. This unique means of judging the constraints of life and appreciating the exigencies of conscience is to lend myself simply to everything that conscience and life requires of me. Only in this way will I maintain an accord between the necessity that forces me to act and the movement of my own will. Only in this way will I find out whether, in the last analysis, I can ratify, through a definitive acknowledgement of my free reason, this preliminary necessity, and, wh and whether all that had seemed obscure, despotic, evil, I can find clear and good. Hence, on the condition of not leaving the straight path of practice, which we would abandon only through a lack of consistency, practice itself contains a complete method and surely prepares a valid solution to the problem it imposes on all men. Do we understand what this method of direct experimentation is, and do we have the courage to apply it? Are we ready to pay for moral competence at the price of all that we have and all that we are? If not, there is no admissible judgment. For life to be condemned, life itself, once we have experienced what it has to offer, that is most painful, would have to warrant our, regret our regretting all the sacrifices and the efforts made to render it good. Is that the way it is? And if we have not tried the test, are we in a position to complain? 3. Yes, these complaints have to be accepted. It is possible that the straight road leads where no other does. 
It is possible, too, that one be guilty of leaving it. But if one has left it, if one has not entered into it, if one fails along the way, does one cease to count? Science must be as broad as charity, and not ignore even what morality frowns upon. Notwithstanding the sufficiency of practice, another method, destined perhaps to enlighten and perhaps and to justify the first, but quite different from it, becomes legitimate and even necessary. For what reasons? Here are some of the principal ones. To be sure, no one is forced to debate with his conscience, to haggle about his, submis his submission and to speculate on practice. But then who escapes the curiosity of the mind? Who has not doubted the goodness of his task, and has never asked himself, why does he do what he does? When traditions are shattered, as they are, when the rule of Mars is, is subverted on almost every score, when, through a strange corruption of nature, the lure of what popular consciousness calls evil exercises on all a sort of fascination, is it possible to act always with the happy and courageous simplicity that no uncertainty undermines and that no sacrifice disheartens? No, if the method of the simple and the generous is good, and we should at, we should at least be able to show why. Such an apologia could only be the supreme effort of speculation while proving the supremacy of action. Besides, even when we have no hesitation as to what is to be done, do we always do what we know and what we will? And if repeated failings spoil the experiment of life, if the first sincerity is lost, if there rises across our path the irreparable past of an act, will we not have to have recourse to an indirect way? And is not reflection, roused by the obstacle itself, necessary, like a light, to find once again the lost way? Often born of a proud or sensual curiosity, the presence of evil, even in the most naive consciousness, produces in turn for it a need for discussion and science. This complement, or this supplement of moral spontaneity, must therefore be sought in ideas as scientific as possible. Let us be careful. Nothing is more perilous and less scientific than to govern ourselves in practice according to incomplete ideas. Action cannot be partial or provisional, as knowledge can be. Hence, when one has begun to discuss the principles of human conduct, one must not take the examination into account as long as the examination has not been brought to completion, because we have to have something principal, something central, something total, to illumine and reg regulate acts. Now, if it is true that no one is obliged to speculate on practice, still there is almost no one who does not have his own ideas on life, and does not think himself authorized to apply them. Hence it is essential to push this examination to the end, since only at the end will the authority that speculation often usurps over action become legitimate. It is therefore a science of action that must be constituted, a science that will be that will be such only insofar as it will be total, because every way of thinking and deliberate living implies a complete solution of the problem of existence, a science that will be such only insofar as we will determine for all a single solution to the exclusion of all others. For my reasons, if they are scientific, must not have any more value for me than for others nor must they leave room for other conclusions than mine. In this, in this also, the direct method of practical verification needs to be completed, but this remains to be shown. Entirely personal and incommunicable, the teachings of moral experimentation are valid in effect only for the one who instigates them in himself. No doubt he has succeeded in learning where one acquires true charity of soul and in grounding in himself an intimate certainty that surpasses in, our, in its own sense every other assurance. But what he knows because he does it, he cannot communicate to others who do not do it. In the eyes of strangers, it is only opinion, belief, or faith. For himself, his science does not have the universal, impersonal, and imperious character of science but it is good for each one to be able to justify, as fully as possible, against the sophisms of passion, the reasons for his conduct. 
It is good for each to be able to transmit and demonstrate to all the solution he knows to be certain for the problem imposed on all. It is good that if our life is to judge us with a sovereign rigor, we should already be able, if we will to do so, to judge it with sufficient clarity. Why it is legitimate and even becomes necessary to raise the speculative problem of practice is therefore manifest. How it is raised, we must now look into. 4. In what way in the study of reality do truly scientific methods proceed? They exclude all false explanations of a fact, all fortuitous coincidences, all accessory circumstances, so as to place the mind before the necessary and sufficient conditions, and to constrain it to affirm the law. <clears throat> this indirect way alone is that of science, because starting from doubt and systemically eliminating every chance of error and every cause of illusion, it closes every way out but one. Hence, Truth imposes itself. It is demonstrated. Now there will be a science of action, properly speaking, only in so far as we shall succeed in transporting into the critique of life what is essential about this indirect method. For we must not make, make believe that men are other than what they are, for the most part, especially men of thought. They only do as they please, that is, they like to choose, and to know where they are going, and to know with certainty they will go down blind alleys. Without a complete investigation, there is no conclusive and constraining demonstration. If in the sciences of nature, the mind surrenders only before the impossibility of doubting, all the more in the world of his passions, of his sufferings, and of his intimate struggles, does man hang on and remain where he is, as long as he is not dislodged from the position. Wherever it may be, where self-love, in the absence of any other interest, keeps him. Ask no one to make the first step. Science has nothing to concede. It would be to take the first step, and the decisive step, to accept, be it only by way of a trial, or a simple postulate, moral obligation, or even the natural necessity to act. This is the constraint, these are the practical exigencies that are in question, and that must be justified in the least indulgent eyes, and through the effort of the very ones who try to run away from them with all their might. The moment I raise the theoretical problem of action, and set out to discover a scientific solution for it, I no longer admit, at least provisionally, and from this different viewpoint, the value of any practical solution. The usual words, good, evil, duty, culpability, which I had used are, from this moment on, bereft of meaning, until, if occasion arises, I can restore them to all their plenitude. In the face of necessity itself, which, to speak the language of appearances, forces me to be an act, I refuse to ratify in the order of thought what in the order of practice I have resolved to practice. And since we must first eliminate all false ways of being and acting, Instead of seeing only the straight way, I will explore all those that are furthest away from it. My situation, then, is quite clear. On one side, in action, complete and absolute submission to the dictates of conscience, and immediate docility. My provisional morality is all of morality, without any objection in the intellectual or sensual order authorizing me to break this pact with duty. On the other side, in the scientific realm, complete and absolute independence. This does not mean, according to a common understanding, the immediate emancipation of the whole of life with regard to any regulating idea, any moral yoke, any positive faith. That would be to draw conclusions before having justified the premises, and to let thought usurp a premature authority, at the very point where we are recognizing its incompetence. Whatever the scientific result of the, of the examination underway will be, only in the end must it return to and illumine the practical discipline of life. The independence necessary for the science of action must therefore be understood this way. This research itself will manifest more clearly the fundamental importance and the unique originality of the problem. What is at issue in effect? to find out whether notwithstanding the obvious constraints that oppress us, whether through the darkness where we must walk, 
whether in the depths of, of unconscious life, whence emerges the mystery of action as an enigma whose word will perhaps be dreadful, whether in all the aberrations of the spirit there does not subsist, in spite of it all, the seed of a science and the principle of an intimate revelation, such that nothing will appear arbitrary or unexplained in the destiny of each, such that there will be a definitive consent of man to his fate, whatever it may be, such finally that this clarity unmasking consciences will not change in their depth, even those it will overwhelm, as if by surprise. At the root of the most insolent negations, or the most foolish extravagances of the will, we must inquire whether there is not an initial movement that persists always, that we love and we will, even when we deny it, or when we abuse of it. The principle of the judgment to be passed on each individual must be found within each, and the independence of the mind becomes indispensable in this research, not only because it is important to admit first, without prejudice of any sort, all the infinite diversity of human consciousness, or consciences, but especially because in each consciousness, under all the unrecognized sophisms and the unavowed failings, we must find the primitive aspiration so as to lead all in full sincerity to the very end of their voluntary elan. Thus, instead of starting from a single point, whence would spread the doctrine peculiar to one mind, it is necessary for us to place ourselves at the extremities of the most divergent spokes in order to lay hold at the very center of the truth essential to each con every consciousness and the movement common to all wills. As I approach the science of action, then, I can take nothing for granted, no facts, no principles, no duties. It is to strip myself of every precarious support that I have been working. Let us not pretend like Descartes through an artifice that smacks of the schools with all its seriousness, to extract from doubt and illusion the very reality of being, for I do not sense any consistency in that reality of dreaming. It is empty and remains outside of me. I will not hear with Pascal of plain heads or tails over nothingness and eternity, for to wager would already be to already ratify the alternative. Let no one following Kant pull out from the I know not what darkness, I know not what categorical imperative, for I would treat it as suspect and as an intruder. We must therefore, on the contrary, take in all the negations that destroy one another, as if it were possible to admit them altogether. We must enter into all prejudices, as if they were legitimate, into all errors, as if they were sincere, into all passions, as if they had the generosity they boast of, into all philosophical systems, as if each one held in its grip the infinite truth it thinks it has cornered. We must, taking within ourselves all consciousness, become the intimate accomplice of all, in order to see if they bear within themselves their own justification or condemnation. They have to become arbiters of themselves, and they have to see where their most frank and their most interior will would lead them. They have to learn what they do without knowing it, what they already know without willing it, and without doing it. Thus, for the problem of action to be raised scientifically, we should not have any moral postulate or intellectual given to accept, it is not a particular question, then, a question like any other that presents itself before us. It is the question, the one without which there is none other. It is so primary that any preliminary concession would be a petitio principi. Just as every fact contains all its law, so also every consciousness hides within itself the secret and the law of life. There is no hypothesis to be made. We cannot suppose either that the problem is resolved, or even that it is imposed, or simply posited. It must be enough for the most intimate orientation of hearts to be revealed, to let the will and action unfold in each individual, down to the final agreement or to the, fi or to the contradiction, between the primitive movement and the end in which it terminates. The difficulty is to introduce nothing external or artificial into this profound drama of life. It is, if need be, to correct reason, and the will through reason, and the will themselves. It is, through a methodical progress, to make errors, negations, and failings of every nature 
produce the hidden truth that souls live by and that they may perhaps die of for eternity. 5. Thus everything is called into question, even whether there is a question. The spring for the entire investigation must come from the investigation itself, and the movement of thought will sustain itself without any external artifice. What is this internal mechanism? It is this, for it is, go it is good in advance, not for the sake of validity, but for the sake of clarity of exposition, to indicate the moving thought and calling into question, along with the value of life, the very reality of being. To understand the common intertwining of science, morality, and metaphysics. Among these, there are no contradictions, because where people have seen incompatible realities, there are still only heterogeneous and solitary phenomena. And if some have burdened themselves with inextricable difficulties where there are none, it is for having failed to recognize the one question where the difficulty lies. In, in question is the whole of man. It is not in thought alone that we must seek him out. It is in action that we should have to transport the center of philosophy because there, there is to be found out the center of life. If I am not what I will to be, what I will, not with my lips, not in desire or in project, but with all my heart, with all my strength, in all my acts. I am not in the depths of my being. There is a willing and a love for being, or else there is nothing. This constraint that appeared to me as a tyrannical constraint, this obligation, which at first seemed despotic, must in the last analysis be seen as manifesting and exercising the profound inaction of my will. Otherwise, they would destroy me. The whole nature of things and the chain of necessities that weigh on my life is only the series of means I have to will, that I do will in effect, to accomplish my destiny. Involuntary and constrained being would no longer be being, so true is it that the last word of all goodness and that is to be to will and to love. Pessimism stops too soon in the philosophy of the will. For in spite of pain and despair, we will still be right in admitting the truth and the excellence of being if we will it of ourselves in all sincerity and in all spontaneity. To suffer from being, to hate my being, I have to admit and to love being. Evil and hatred are only by becoming a homage to love. Also, whatever apparent disproportion there may be between what I know, what I will, and what I do, however fearful the consequences of my acts may be, even if able to lose myself but not to escape myself, I am to the point that it would better be better for me not to be. Still I must, in order to be, always will to be, even if I have to bear within myself the painful contradiction of what I will and what I am. There is nothing arbitrary or tyrannical in my destiny, for the least external pressure would be enough to strip being of all value, all beauty, all consistency. I have nothing I have not received, and yet at the same time everything has to arise from me. Even the being that I have received seems Im and seems imposed on me. Whatever I do, and whatever I undergo, I have to sanction this being and engender it anew, so to speak, by a personal adherence, without my most sincere freedom ever disavowing it. This is the will, the most intimate and the most free, that it is most important to find in all my endeavors and to bring finally to its perfect fulfillment. What is the most important? What is most important is to bring the reflected movement of my willing into equation with its spontaneous movement. But it is in action that this relation of either equality or discordance is determined. Hence, the importance of studying action, for it manifests at once the double will of man. It constructs all his destiny within him, like a world that is his original work and is to contain the complete explanation of his history. The ultimate effort of art is to make men do what they will, as it is to make them realize what they know. That is the ambition of this work. Not that we would violate here the protective obscurities that ensure the disinterestedness of love and the merit of goodness, but if there is a salvation, it cannot be tied to the learned solution of an obscure problem, nor denied to the per perseverance of a rigorous speech. 
and can only be offered clearly to all. This clarity must be born to those who have turned away from it, perhaps unknowingly, into the night they make for themselves, a night where the full revelation of their obscure state will not change them if they do not first contribute to change themselves willingly. The only supposition we will not make initially is to think they go astray knowingly and willingly, that they refuse the light while they sense that it envelops them, and that they curse being while admitting its goodness. And yet perhaps we shall, we shall have to come to this very access, since there is nothing in all the attitudes possible for the will, or in all the illusions of consciousness, that is not to enter into the science of action. Fictions and absurdities, if you will, but real absurdities. There is in the illusory, the imaginary, even the false, a reality, something living and substantial, that is embodied in human acts, a creation which no philosophy has sufficiently taken into account. How important it is to accept, to unify and bring to completion, so many scattered aspirations, like members pushing, perishing through their divisions, in order to build up through the infinity of errors and by them the universal truth, a truth that lives in the secret of every consciousness and from which no man ever frees himself. But let us forget now this anticipated look at the road to be taken. Let us give ourselves without afterthought and without distrust, precisely because no side has been taken, nor any act of confidence asked. Even the point of departure, there is nothing, could not be admitted, because it, could, it would still be an external given, and like an arbitrary and subjugating concession. The ground has been completely cleared.